What's your take on uh, the chances uh, of recession in the next uh, 12 to 18 months? Well, first of all, I'm not running for office, but thanks for considering me, Wilfred. But uh, to, your, to your real question mm -hmm. there... It's a, I mean, it's a we, wild open field. At, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's wide open field, and uh, I don't think uh, my name belongs in that hat. Uh, but, you know, when you start to look at what's going on within the fixed income market, um, I heard Mike say something about the deflationary scare. But I think more importantly, what we had was actually a growth scare. Uh, it's been concentrated in the manufacturing sector. And we've seen some signs that there may be some rebounds starting in that data. It still looks relatively poor, but there are some signs of life in there. And when you look at the growth outlook for 2020, and just, for instance, let's take how fourth quarter GDP has been trending. Uh, when you look at like GDP now, it started off as a very, very low growth rate coming into the quarter. And now we're back on what, what has really been the trend since the financial crisis, about 2.3% for the fourth quarter. So it turns out that the growth story uh, remains intact. Uh, some of that may be attributed to the Fed's behavior, uh, their reaction function within the marketplace and cutting rates. Um, that, that's still working its way through the economy. And right now we're actually seeing a pickup not just in growth, but also in inflation. And so I know people focus on the Fed's measure of inflation, that is their core PCE number. But when I look across the spectrum of other measures of core inflation, we're seeing things that are, that are definitely north of 2%. So I think investors need to think about the idea, not just asset price uh, inflation that we've seen this year, but maybe actually traditional inflation starts to make a bit of a comeback in 2020. Jeff, you know, this has been a pretty good year. If you're looking at your portfolio and want to do some management going into 2020, is it smart now to start trimming some winners and plow that money into some underperformers? Or will those winners just keep winning next year? These big tech names, for example, come to mind. Yeah, I mean, when you look across it, there has been a lot of momentum this year uh, across asset class. It's been very hard to lose money. And so when you look back at 2018, it was a year where almost no asset class as a broad sector really had positive rates of return. Uh, this year, we're seeing north of 90 percent of those assets are, are now generating positive returns and very strong returns. So I think when investors think about the turn of the calendar year, unlike last year, where we had the challenges of the Fed, we had the, the, the balance sheet unwind that was causing problems and stresses within the marketplace, and really a Fed that wasn't paying attention to some of that economic data, you have just the opposite now. So you have a, a bit of a tailwind there, but a tailwind should not imply complacency. And what we're looking at here is that it's hard to find things that are down uh, in 2019 that, that really scream a buy today. Uh, but as you would mentioned, things that have underperformed. There are sectors, specifically within the bond market, uh, that have lagged and it still can benefit from a strong economy. And that's what we've really been doing this year is trimming some of those winners that have been uh, successful in the credit markets and really looking at those uh, parts of the fixed income market, which had been somewhat laggards, albeit a strong positive rate of return. And specifically, yeah. that, that has to do with the securitized market. Go ahead. Jeff, it's Stephanie Link. On the, on the inflation um, issue, do you see commodity price inflation next year, or do you see it coming more from wages? Well, it's really come from core inflation, and now you're starting to see the, the rebound in commodity prices. Uh, I think the OPEC meeting is one that really got uh, oil to respond, where uh, there was significant production cuts that, that really helped bring in that, that support level for the oil market. But what I'm looking at, really, is that if we are uh, doing this phase one trade deal and we're talking about no more trade conflict, we're actually getting peace within the trade markets, I think the industrial metals are the thing that could see some rebound. You've seen that recently with copper prices. And you guys may know that we follow the copper to gold ratio uh, here as kind of a, a way of thinking about the direction of the Treasury yield market. And you're seeing that really start to go upward, too. So when I think about the inflation, I think it's, it's definitely been there in core most of the year. You're seeing the commodities no longer be um, a detractor from headline inflation. And as we go into next year, uh, they'll actually be a positive contributor to inflation. So using the kind of models we look at for inflation, and they do get whipped around by commodity prices, we see uh, next year's inflation rate being north of 2% almost all of 2020. And so I do think that the commodity sector is one that has been beaten down. Uh, investors have loathed it, and it could be one that's poised to rebound just simply on the trade rhetoric. Jeff, I wanted to ask uh, about the outlook for rates in Europe. I, I'm sure you noticed today the Swedish central bank reversed its uh, negative rates, put its uh, central bank rate back to zero. Do you think that Christine Lagarde will follow suit to some extent 
next year, clearly the, the German Bund yield reacted a little bit to the upside today. Do you think Treasuries would then track that if, if we saw rising yields in Europe next year? Yeah, well, I think you nailed it right there. The Reichsbank moving back to a zero rate is a monumental um, a moment out there in the uh, rates market with central banks. And so uh, the Reichsbank is essentially saying we no longer see a benefit to negative yielding overnight lending rates, and it's going to boost that overall yield curve. I hope that Ms. Lagarde has the fortitude to do something similar. Negative rates have been a drag on the banking sector. You guys were talking about banking stocks prior to my segment here, and that's really what's been a big drag, we believe, on the banking and insurance sector globally. Uh, when you talk about the amount of negative yielding securities out there, it's just a bad business model. So I hope Ms. Lagarde has that fortitude to really get off this negative 50 basis point uh, rate. You would see, that I think, the Swiss follow suit. And let's get back to actually having at least zero yields and, and, po and, and hopefully positive yields on the front of the curve. But I think, as, as I said at the beginning, you nailed it, that if there is pressure on European rates, uh, which I think there would be under that scenario, uh, you've got to expect the U.S. rate uh, market to follow in lockstep. So I don't think there's a place of safety to hide in the U.S., even though we have higher yields. I don't think that if rates are rising in the euro land, that it's going to be something different here. Uh, we've moved in lockstep to the downside in 2019, and I could definitely see that being as another harbinger of why yields should go up in 2020.